Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm going to set aside our present study in 2 Thessalonians to talk to you a little bit about something that's going on prophetically. Out of over the 500, 600 videos that I've made the past four years, I don't think anything comes anywhere near as close to being as exciting as what you're about to hear in this video and I would ask that all of you who follow this channel all of those who are listening to this video I would ask that you hang on every word I don't say that very often I don't do this very often and I think that what you're gonna find out at the end of this if you've paid attention is you're gonna you're going to discover something very remarkable that's taking place prophetically. I've struggled as to where to begin with this, so I, I think where I'd like to begin is with the black stone. I think many of you know where I stand as it regards the identity of the beast of Revelation, the Antichrist system. I ask once again that you pay close attention to what I'm about to say. The black stone is a rock set into the eastern corner of the, of the Kaaba, the ancient building, in the center of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. And it is revered, it is worshipped, it's respected greatly by Muslims as a... As a and uh, as a relic, which according to Muslim tradition, it dates back to the time of Adam and Eve. And this religion, the tradition holds that this black stone fell from heaven and it failed to show Adam and Eve where to build an altar, which became the first temple on earth the first temple on earth. They believe that the stone was originally white, but it's since turned black because of the sins of the people who touch it. So it's touching it results in a an expiation for sins. Adam's altar and the stone were said to have been lost during Noah's flood and forgotten. And Abraham was said to have later found the black stone at the, at the original site of, of Adam's altar when an angel revealed it to him. And Abraham ordered his son Ishmael, who in, uh, in their belief is an ancestor of Muhammad, to build an altar, uh, to build a new temple, okay, the Kaaba, into which the stone has, has been set. It's been embedded into the Kaaba. So I think that's a good place to start with this. But now what I want to do is I want to give you a little, uh, just a, a refresher course on uh, the two sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael. Now we know from Scripture that Ishmael was born and he was brought up in Abraham's household. And then some 13 years later, Sarah conceived Isaac. And it was with Isaac that God established his covenant. Isaac became Abraham's sole heir, and Ishmael and Hagar, his mother, were banished to the desert. God did, however, promise, uh, promised Hagar that Ishmael would raise up a great nation of his own. 
God had a plan for Abraham to place him and his descendants in the realm of Canaan, uh, Isaac. He had a plan for Isaac that he would place him in the realm of Canaan, uh, also known as the Promised Land and the Holy Land. And upon arrival in the Holy Land, the Promised Land, God assured Abraham that he would provide the region to his descendants. We read about that in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, these two sons are so important prophetically that you would do well to spend some time understanding the relationship that they have, these two sons, Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, to last day's prophecy. Now, of course, we know what happened with Sarah. Sarah, uh, she uh, was barren. Sarah was barren. And uh, even to Abraham, what God had said concerning uh, Ishmael and Isaac, particularly Isaac, uh, at, well, let me rephrase that. What, what God had particularly said concerning uh, Sarah bearing a son most of you realize that they they really thought that that was practically uh, insane. I mean, because his his wife Sarah was barren, but her her infertility, her not being able to bear a son, was no coincidence. That's that's another whole video right there. It's no coincidence. It was not by accident. It was planned. It was purposed. Because that was to be very significant in when, as, when it came to the development of the modern Middle East and final days prophecy. God promised Abraham that he would have an heir, one who would come from your own body says Genesis chapter 15. But Sarah was impatient. So impatient, Sarah told Abraham to take her Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, and to produce a child by her. Now, the, the actual Hebrew text makes it absolutely crystal clear that Abraham and Hagar were married, okay? Uh, and so Hagar was to produce a child, through a, by Abraham, or Abraham was to produce a child through Hagar. And so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, well, then Sarah, it was Sarah that became, I guess what the word would be, would be, uh, I think the, what the, the text says there in Genesis is that uh, Sarah despised just Hagar. She despised Hagar. And fearing the wrath of, of, of Sarah, Hagar fled the land after she conceived Ishmael. I think that's pretty much how the story goes. But then later on we read that uh, somehow an angel appeared or the, the pre-incarnate Christ appeared or, or a heavenly word was delivered to Hagar telling her to return. And it was, it was some comfort to her that her son would have many children and descendants, although it was said that they would be in conflict with other nations, other families, other nations. The angel said, your descendants will be, uh, will number so many that they'll be too numerous to count. 
Many of you are familiar with this account. So you'll give birth to a son. You'll name him Ishmael. And his, his, uh, he'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Now we have Isaac. 14 years. 14 years after the birth of Ishmael. God graced Abraham with a second son, a stepbrother to Ishmael, conceived with his wife Sarah. And God instructed Abraham to name their son Isaac. And Isaac, in turn, fathered Jacob, also named Israel, the father of the Israelites. So, therefore, uh, Ishmael and Isaac, their descendants, are cousins. Now, after the birth, birth of, of Isaac, after Isaac was born, Sarah, she continued to uh, despise Hagar being around and, and Ishmael uh, as well. And so Sarah had him sent away. And the child grew. And on the day that Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son that, uh, uh, that Hagar had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of the slave woman and her son. For that woman's son, Ishmael, will not share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Now, folks, I wish I had time to go into how that, that relates to the subject of law and grace as, as it's spoken about in Galatians 4, where that we are to cast out the bondwoman. It contrasts the bondwoman with the free woman. We're not under law, but we're under grace. One is represents that which comes uh, of the Spirit, the other of the flesh. I don't have time to go through that. What I, what I will read is I'll read you uh, a, a short passage here from Galatians. It may, may help you uh, connect that uh, to what we're discussing here. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he was, he who was of the, the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, listen, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not, shall not, shall not, listen to me, folks, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So now back to the two sons. Abraham was pretty upset about all this. It, 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 stre it stressed him out a, quite a bit. But God said to him, 
do not be so distressed about uh, the boy and your, and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he's your offspring. There's a relationship between Ishmael and the black stone. There's a relationship between Isaac and the nation of Israel and the covenant that God made with Abraham concerning Isaac, who fathered Jacob, which became Israel, in which they are the receive the, the inheritance, okay, the promise. It didn't come through Hagar, it didn't come through the bondwoman, it didn't come through Ishmael, but Isaac, okay? And it has deeply profound spiritual connections or relationships with the covenant that God made with Israel. His holy covenant. Okay, you're going to hear me talk more about that. Holy covenant. And because we're going to contrast that with something that is not holy. An agreement that's not holy. I also want to bring into this, and I, and I hope I don't just muddy the waters here, but I've got to bring into this, uh, factor into this thing, John the Baptist. Here you got a guy named Zacharias. He's the husband of Elizabeth. He's the father of John the Baptist. Prophesied of God's, he, Zacharias, actually prophesied concerning uh, God's promises that he made to Abraham as well as other prophets concerning the salvation, the redemption and salvation of God's people by the Messiah who was to come through the announcement of his son John. Okay? If you uh, turn into Luke chapter 1, what you'll read is his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began that we should be, listen, listen, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant. Remember his holy covenant. Folks, I beg you to take a highlighter and highlight, remember his holy covenant in Luke 1 verse 72. Luke 1 72. Remember his holy covenant. If you read on, continue on in, seven, in verse 73, the oath which he swore, swore to our father Abraham, okay, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in righteousness, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, sh shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. It's talking about John the Baptist, okay? Now, jump ahead. We're going to jump ahead now. Man, I, I hate doing this to you folks. But let's jump ahead now to the two witnesses. Okay? In the tribulation period, where we see a repeat of John the Baptist's message, the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? 
listen to me, okay? The two witnesses during the tribulation period are not just witnessing to Gentiles, and they're not just delivering a message, a gospel of grace, of salvation, you know, a call to, to come and, and, and believe in Christ as we are today. The gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we depart, the Holy Spirit in us departs. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave the earth, but He leaves in us. It is the end of the church age, okay? And the gospel, according to the scriptures, the one that the gospel by which we are saved, a gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. I'm trying to get you to, to recall the fact that this was the gospel this was the gospel that John the Baptist preached when Christ came on the scene the first time. Okay? When we are gone, the two witnesses will again proclaim the gospel of, king, of the kingdom. It's a repeat of John the Baptist. Okay? To a great extent. So, I need you to understand that, that, that that's what happens. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And now I want you to understand that in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Isaiah, Kings, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, probably Joel, I don't know, a number of other Old Testament prophets, they all warned against Israel forsaking their God in exchange for idols, for idol worship, the worshiping of strange gods, be interesting to see someone do a study sometime on how many times that Israel, that God warned Israel about forsaking Him and in, in worshiping strange idols, strange gods. God made a covenant through Abraham with His people There was, there was a line, folks, that came from God, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Holy Covenant. Okay? It, it's a covenant of promise, of inheritance. This, this is what I'm trying to get you to see here. On the other hand, when we factor into Ishmael into this, we have a, a stark contrast between Israel, Jacob, Isaac, Isaac, and Ishmael. If, uh, if you read Ezekiel chapter 44, when you, when you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh to be in my sanctuary to defile it my house and when you offered my food the fat and the blood then they broke my covenant because of all your abominations they broke my covenant okay go to the new go up we can go to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? So, now I want to point your attention to here's where it gets down to where the rubber meets the road here i want to point your attention to a recent article published by the jerusalem post okay concerning trump and kushner's what they're calling the abraham what they call the abraham accord okay 
the historic peace agreement between the UAE, United Arab Emirates, Ishmael, and Israel. Isaac. Okay? You can't listen, folks. This Abraham Accord is is an attempt to reconcile these two brothers. Are you following me here? Oh, but Steve, wait a minute. I thought that with 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 all that we understand about these two brothers and and the the inheritance going to to Isaac, not Ishmael. Well, what is this all about? Let me, I need to say right here at the outset, okay? This Abraham Accord is not. Please don't misunderstand me. This Abraham, this this new peace agreement, what they're calling the Abraham Accord. It is not. Trump's not the Antichrist. Kushner's not the Antichrist. Uh, the United States is not the beast system. Okay, We're, it is not Israel entering into a covenant, an agreement with the making some agreement with the Antichrist. Okay, as is spoken of in end times prophecy. That's not what we're looking at here. Folks, peace treaties are made all the time. What I'm trying to draw your attention to here is, and I hope that you see this, is the significance, the, the real truth behind the Abraham Accord. You are going to hear the real truth about the Abraham Accord right here in this video, on this channel, right here, okay? I doubt you will anywhere else. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, I say that humbly, but in all honesty, no one's talking about what I'm talking about here. You're about to see just how Israel views this, as, as well as the United Arab Emirates, how they view this Abraham, uh, Abraham Accord. Okay? So, this Jerusalem Post article is dated August 29 of this year. August 29, this is what, September the 3rd, just a few days ago. It's titled, Is the UAE-Israel Deal a Manifestation of Abraham's Legacy? And it has a subtitle, Remarkably, Abraham's Legacy is so powerful and relevant that a peace accord is named after him almost 4,000 years since his birth. Now, I want to read through this article, and I'll put a link to it in the the description of this video, you can read the article for yourself. The elation felt in both Israel and the United Arab Emirates over the recent peace deal emerged so powerfully at a public discussion I hosted this week with Ambassadors Michael Oren and Dor Gold, Jewish Council of the Emirates President Ross Creel. Highlight the words elation felt. The elation felt okay the South African born Ross said the, the feelings of the Jewish community and its interaction with the broader society society at this time reminded him of the excitement in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was released and the journey to peace and reconciliation began now he said there is a palpable joy across a very broad range of people in Dubai for what this peace deal means and how it can benefit the two countries. This reminds me of the Midrash that describes how at the moment of Abraham's passing, his warring sons, Isaac and Ishmael, reconcile at his funeral, holding hands. And now, all these generations later, the children of Abraham, the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, listen, folks, have begun a historic reconciliation through the UAE-Israel deal so aptly named the Abraham Accord and are setting out a path to peace 
in this conflict of brothers. Stop. Steve, are you saying that this is when they cry peace and safety? No, I'm not. Steve, are you saying that this is the, the deal that, that Israel is making with the Antichrist? No, I'm not. Please don't misunderstand. Treaties are made all, peace agreements are made all the time. Normally they're broken. Let's continue on. Remarkably, Abraham's legacy is so powerful and relevant that a peace accord is named after him almost 4,000 years since his birth. We are witness to the fulfillment of the divine promise to Abraham. Listen, we, we are witness to the fulfillment of the divine promise to Abraham that you will be a father of a multitude of nations. The fulfillment of the divine promise. We are witness to that, says the article. This is not about biology, but rather about values. Well, folks, I've got to say that that's a lie. It is, a, it is about biology. Well, I guess I suppose it is about values as well, but, but let's read on. God chose Abraham to champion the moral and spiritual values vital for humankind to survive and thrive. Say what? Let's read that again. God chose Abraham to champion the moral and spiritual va values vital for humankind to survive and thrive. Now, I want you to note that this writer is a rabbi, and there's a denial on his part here to admit to Israel's failure as it regards Israel's unbelief. Okay, God did choose Abraham to champion the moral and spiritual values vital for humankind to survive and thrive. But only in the sense, listen, only in the sense that Israel accepted its true Messiah and became a light to the nations, which it did not. Okay, folks, listen. It didn't do that. Let's look. We'll continue on. First, Abraham taught us that our world was created by the one and only God, the source of all, sin, all things. By the time Abraham appears in history, humankind had forgotten the clarity of belief in one God that Adam and Eve and their family had at the dawn of civilization. Abraham came into a world of paganism in which people believed in multiple gods, and he brought the radical and profound concept of monotheism. There is one God who holds everything together and is the creator of all people and things. In response, God gave Abraham the merit of founding the Jewish nation, the people of Israel, who would later at Sinai be charged with carrying his ideas into the world. Well, that's true, but will the writer make any mention of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, here? Well, no. Don't count on it. I read through the whole thing, and, and he doesn't. Let, let, let me back up and read that again. God, the writer says, God gave Abraham the merit of founding the Jewish nation, the people of Israel, who would later at Sinai be charged with carrying his ideas into the world. It's funny how that you could speak a, a, a truth and it'd be so wrong. It's, it's not that... He, that's not true, that what he's saying is not true. It's just that he makes no mention of the Messiah. In effect, Abraham was asking God to wait for him while he attended to the needs of the travelers. And based on this, the Talmud makes a dramatic statement. Greater is welcoming guests than receiving the divine presence. Every human being has within them a divine soul, a reflection of God Himself, and that this makes human beings the greatest tangible manifestation of God's presence on earth. And so even though the divine presence came to be with Him in the wake of His circumcision, Abraham knew he would, in fact, have a more intense interaction with God through engaging with the divine image in another human being. The two big ideas of Abraham's life, 
belief in one God and the, and, and the inoperative or the imperative of treating all people with compassion and kindness can bring peace to the world, which, which makes naming this historic peace accord between Israel and the UAE after Abraham so significant. No mention of the Messiah. No mention. Now, I want you to listen to this last part of the article very closely. One creator of all human beings means we, now listen close, we, we all share a common humanity. I want you to think, try to put in, into the forefront of your mind as I read this last part of this article, this end times, antichrist, beast, new world order, system all right listen to me listen to it very close all share a common humanity there is a fundamental and unconditional equality and dignity in all people that emanates naturally from the divine soul within each of us to create and nurture peace that is meaningful pervasive and enduring we must see each other as our forefather abraham saw everyone as godly beings created in the image of the divine. At a time in which hope has been in short supply, let all people of goodwill around the world rally together in unity, embrace our common humanity, recognize the divine within us all, and celebrate the Abraham Accord. And let us pray it is only the first step in what will become a flourishing of peace and reconciliation among the children of Abraham and a wide and warm embrace of the spirit of Abraham's vision and values by all humankind. And that's the end of the article. And now that we've gone through that article, I direct your attention to Daniel eleven twenty eight. Then shall he, the Antichrist, return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Read down a couple more verses to chapter 11, verse 30. For, sh for ships of, of Ketim will come against him, therefore he will be disheartened, and listen, folks, he will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. I don't know how many of you remember. It's been years ago. When I, 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 I published a video trying to describe to you people how that how interesting that it is that you have different factions within a religion you know even within christianity there are those uh, factions which which they see par other parts of christianity as well they're the worldly okay they're, they're the worldly christians we're the good christians they're the worldly christians And you see the same thing when it comes to Sunni, Shia, okay, Iran, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is viewed by Iran as being worldly. I'll go ahead and say it, Islam. They got all the wealth, they got, you know, they got the diamond studded, you know, uh, Rolls Royces, you know, they got all this oil, they got all this wealth. Keep in mind, that's where the stone is in Mecca. Okay? Keep in mind that this Abraham Accord is a reconciliation of two brothers that, that I'm trying to get you to wrap your mind around the fact that nowhere, at least in my humble opinion, in God's understanding of all of this, 
was there ever to be any reconciliation between two brothers, half-brothers, in which he himself stated that they would be in conflict with one another. Many of you understand from my past videos what I believe to be the final last days Antichrist beast of revelation system. I can't go through all that again. What I'm trying to get you to see here with this Abraham Accord is that it has such a prophetic, has such prof profound prophetic significance concerning how close we are to the tribulation period. Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time in which there is an agreement made by unbelieving Israel. They enter into, according to Scripture, a covenant of death and hell with the Antichrist. Okay? But there are those Jews, believing Jews, who do not. Because Christ will at that time confirm His already existing covenant, and I'm talking about the Holy Covenant with those Jews. Okay? So you've got it going two ways. You've got believing Israel, unbelieving Israel. Believing Israel in the sense of what? Believing in the Messiah? No. Believing in the sense of that they perhaps maybe, I mean, if they do come to believe in that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. But what I'm saying by believing is, is in the sense is that they believe they are, they, they adhere to God, God confirms His already existing covenant that He made with them through Abraham. It came from Abraham to, through, through Abraham by God through Abraham to Isaac, Jacob, Israel. Okay? And He confirms that already existing covenant. That is a holy covenant. That, the Bible speaks of that as a holy covenant. And in Daniel 11.30... We see the Antichrist becoming enraged at the Holy Covenant and, t and taking action where that he, he comes back to Israel and he shows regard for those who forsake, forsake the Holy Covenant. Okay? These are the ones who enter into a covenant of death and hell with the Antichrist. I wish I could somehow simplify all this, recap this for you in a way that would really just lay lay it bare and make it simple. I don't know how to do that, folks. I'm just trying to show you where Israel's mind is at at the present time. This article reveals exactly where, keep in mind, this was written by a rabbi. And keep in mind, this was written only a few days ago. Keep in mind that this article has to do with the Abraham Accord, which was recently enacted by, agreed upon, by the efforts of Trump and Kushner, as well as others. But the United States had a hand. It had a role in this. It has... It's not dividing the land of Israel, okay? It is simply a covenant. If you look at it purely from the political perspective, I think it's an effort on the U.S. and Israel's part to bring Saudi Arabia into this to try to curb Iran, okay? To keep a leash on Iran. But... The amazing thing about the Abraham Accord, even the name, is, is that it is, it is just like the writer of this article said. It views 
the reconciliation of these two sons of Abraham as a wonderful thing, ignoring the fact that it's not. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. And we're seeing this. We've got a front row seat to this right now where we stand. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for bearing with me on this. Next video, back to the conclusion of chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.